Hi there, this is James Chai, our Forest Park Park Rescue Foundation, registered nonprofit, and I am starting my next, uh, my blog right now. And my blog is for today, October 15th, 2019. This is episode 21. I started September 24th, and I'm going forward and moving forward and just trying to get all of this done here to get all the information out. I want to thank people who are following me on my Facebook page, Our Forest Park Park Rescue Foundation. Uh, people who are following me on my YouTube channel, which is uh, our Farf Bark Bark Rescue Vid Dog Training, as well as following me on Twitter and Instagram at our Farf Bark Bark. If you haven't done so, please uh, subscribe. Please follow my channel, my media, as well as my YouTube channel, just to help me continue to build up the support and to change the world for dogs as I provide my unique uh, perspective and experience of working with extremely dangerous dogs, with extremely skittish dogs. Uh, to be able to work with them and, and give them a uh, give give owners families people a perspective on dogs that had never been done before, which is to actually address dogs on a psychological level similar to that as we would with a human, but at the dog speed of processing of one tenth of a second, the dog's rudimentary cognizance, uh, a processing of a logical and emotional process, their cogency ability to to structure and to uh, um, conclude their decisions. Uh, I also want to say, um, I want to thank Cassian again, uh, absolutely amazing. Thank you for your comments on my YouTube channel on, on the various uh, vlogs that I have there just to give me some great advice in regards to how I can make my vlogs much more um, understandable, uh, simplified as well. I did do a, a, a group session vlog today with awesome massive lovers. Uh, I spent about an hour with them answering uh, three different questions in regards to why dogs have anxiety, why dogs take your keys and uh, shoes and so forth like that, the codependency issues on that aspect of it. And then um, a few other things that we talked about. And then I spent a little bit more time as well today um, with, uh, with a, a group that I've been part of for a while, um, Great Dane Fever 101. And um, that is a, a group that has Marilyn, uh, Love Revere. I'm just going to say the first names, Marilyn, Jeff, and Pam, uh, who run that group as well. You know, same with Awesome Massive Lovers, who's Jackie, who, who runs that. Um, I want to thank people who have invited me in to speak uh, live in their groups to answer their members' questions. If you are, uh, if you have a group, you admin a group or you're part of a group and you'd like me to speak uh, to some of your members in your group, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to do this. There's no cost to the group. Um, I just ask that for members to share my work and to subscribe to my media. And um, it just, it's, it's a lot of fun for me in the sense that I get to fulfill this old man's dream of helping to save dogs lives in the unique way that I've done it. I mean, I've, I've spent, uh, like I say, over 1400 hours uh, alone with extremely dangerous dogs that have significant uh, attack histories, uh, unpredictability. And it is just something for me that when I am working with a dog that has significant issues, it provides me uh, that sense of paying it forward and doing what I'm supposed to do in my life. You know, I've done a lot of different things in my life and, and, and I've had a couple of people ask me today, uh, what my background is and you know to be honest with you I've had a few small little businesses in my in my own I had a retail shoe store um, back in the uh, early 2000 and then um, one of my vendors was going out of business out in California so I ended up buying his little factory out there in Van Nuys California I lived there for about two and a half years and I got into transport as well uh, transport business of hauling cars around um, times were pretty tough at that point then I ended up transitioning to, to uh, getting a used enclosed trailer that held six vehicles and I was driving around transporting high value vehicles for companies such as Bugatti. Literally I moved a, uh, a $2.5 million Bugatti Veyron Super Sport Sang Noir. I'll maybe post that on my page as well. Uh, a lot of things. Lamborghini Mira, a $2 million car, uh, moved for a Bentley Bentayga. I moved the first Bentley Bentayga in Canada. That was for uh, uh, up to Edmonton and down to Calgary, back to Vancouver, etc. So I've had quite a, uh, an establishment as an entrepreneur, as well as having a success in what I was doing in those businesses. That's back in again in the early you know 2000s and early 2010s. I found that what I was doing wasn't making me happy. I was really just not feeling that uh, uh, this is what I wanted to do. So I kind of moved forward with my life and find out the things that really made me happy. 
And, um, you know, if I stuck with the businesses, I would have been quite successful, obviously. But for me, it was more a point that am I happy with who I am and what I'm doing in my own life? And I wasn't. Um, the truth is, as we know, money doesn't buy happiness. Uh, for me, it doesn't. I know there are people, my clients, uh, I, I moved some amazingly, I mean, I've moved cars for people who have had $30 million car, worth of cars in the garage. And, uh, you know, it's something that I, I thought I would be happy moving towards that kind of a lifestyle. Uh, unfortunately, it just didn't feel like I was helping society, uh, especially dogs, which I, I had a great Dane, my beloved Lincoln at the time. I was uh, moving towards a, a successful business, but, um, you know, a lot of things happen, a lot of things change in the sense that I just wasn't happy. It just didn't make me fulfilled, it didn't make me feel that what I was doing in my life was something. So I have um, kind of walked away from everything, shut it all down, didn't even sell the business. I just closed it down and moved towards working with dogs. And I want to thank Elaine Dixon, who is uh, formerly used to run New Hope for Danes, which is the oldest Great Dane Rescue in North America. Oh, sorry, in Canada, uh, established in 1982. She's rescued over 5,000 Great Danes. And she was the one, Elaine was the one that said to me, um, you know, you should look at helping dogs. And at that time, I thought, well, there's no money in it, of course, which was something I was doing anyways as a foster and working with some of the dogs that she had some, some serious issues. But... You know, it made me feel really good inside, and it made me feel like as if I was leading my life the way I was supposed to go through, and um, being able to help a dog that was abused by humans, by either deliberate or, or negligence, um, really kind of made me realize what I wanted to do. And, you know, from, from Lincoln, I went from that part of a dog who was quite reactive, uh, unpredictable, as they would say. They, he would lunge at people for no reason. He had extremely high prey drive a lot of issues and he was 154 pounds so for me it was tough and um you know but i felt really good the way that i was able to stabilize him and i didn't realize he was a dangerous dog at the time people had said to his former family that they should kill him because of his reactivity and he could not be trained by any of the trainers that they'd worked with um you know after my beloved lincoln uh, passed away from uh, severe respiratory distress i then moved towards uh, adopting Nero. Uh, who was 10 years, four months of age. Very dangerous dog, and at 10 years of age, uh, everyone says you can't train an old dog, especially a giant old dog that lived outside and um, had been attacking people and so forth like that viciously. So it's the stuff that I wanted to do, the stuff that made me feel happy. Um, you know, I took on these dogs without any idea what I was doing, and honestly, if I had taken any training, formal training or any training whatsoever in regards to dog training, I would have been so afraid of dogs uh, especially aggressive dogs. I would have been uh, taught incorrectly by people, by trainers and behaviors. I would have been taught by them to say that these certain level of dogs that are aggressive, like Lincoln, can't be helped and they should be killed. Uh, thankfully, I, I kind of did all this. I started all this um, organically, spontaneously, went through the ideas that I thought, listened to Elaine Dixon tell me, just trust your intuition, which is what I ask people to do in their own dogs now. So you're talking to a guy who has zero experience, uh, prior experience working with dogs, and I went trial by fire into uh, situations where uh, the dogs that I've worked with, as you can see in the media coverage, as well as um, you know a lot of the uh, complimentary comments um, about my work, uh, have gone to the predatorial dogs that stalk, trap, and kill human beings. And uh, you know, uh, as I've said, when it comes to uh, treat training a dog with dysfunctions, um, you know. You, know, you can treat train a dog that has obedience, uh, agility, search and rescue, absolutely tra training expedites compliance. But when it comes to a dog that is dysfunctional, treats don't work. And anyone who has a dysfunctional, moderate to extreme to a predatorially dangerous uh, dysfunctional dog, the dog ignores the treats. There's no consoling the dog. There's no bartering. There's no negotiation with a dog that highly dysfunctional. Uh, further to that... Um, just learning some from uh, from some of the most scariest times um, for me, I had to learn by my wits. And, and thankfully, God has blessed me with a gift he shared to be able to read dogs at two-tenths of a second. Um, it's an amazing gift that I have uh, to share with the world. And so um, I'm doing this, like I say, it's a pro bono for, for groups and, and rescue orgs, like I say, almost 3,000 orgs that I work with. 
uh, you know, Save Rocky the Great Dane Rescue and Rehab, largest Great Dane Rescue in North America, uh, as well as, uh, you know, Great Dane Fever with some of their members today, awesome Mastiff lovers, as well as Peace Love Danes. Uh, I also work with some of the other breeds as well, German Shepherds, Pitbull breeds, and some of the groups there. Uh, I don't like to talk about those kind of groups, and the reason why is uh, German Shepherds, Dobermans, Pitbulls get a really bad reputation. And if I start talking about those type of breeds, especially the pit bulls, then the people who don't understand pit bulls, who don't understand dogs, even if they're dog owners themselves, uh, will immediately start to label the pit bull dangerous. Immediately label the Great Pyrenees dangerous, the German Shepherd dangerous, the Doberman dangerous, the Rottweiler dangerous. I can't in good conscience talk about other breeds in the breed that I personally am willing to risk uh, my, my personal safety, but at the same time, I just don't feel it's appropriate for me to start talking about breeds uh, in whole uh, that will just add to the fuel to the fire of, of a lot of people who are opportunistically looking to uh, ostracize uh, the pit bull breed as well. And, and, you know, I have been receiving some flack from uh, from a couple of people uh, in Great Dane groups that I am, quote unquote, singling out Great Danes. As I'm saying, I, I definitely am not. I just want people to be aware that the Great Dane, as with any other dog, has a potential to become reactive if they're not properly uh, socialized, properly uh, um, integrated with uh, with manners, uh, you know, trained as well. Just like a child, you would train your child not to touch hot stove. You want to do the same thing with a dog, any dog, not to let them do silly things with other, uh, other interactions as well. Um, I, I want to thank... Uh, uh, Lindsay Lear in Great Dane Fever. Uh, I spent uh, with her about 45 minutes on a video consult uh, with Great Dane Fever 101 with uh, uh, Pam and Marilyn uh, La Rivera. Uh, like I said, I, I'm pronouncing people's names is so bad for me. Uh, Pam Brown um, and the three of us, the four of us, I, I should say, we did a we did a video conference and I spent about 45 minutes with Lindsay to talk about her Great Dane Kingston, is a year old who uh, suddenly. Quote unquote, uh, started to be reactive to their ten-year-old daughter that he that they had him when he since he was ten week I think eight or ten week old puppy, and suddenly he seemed to change and it turned out as simple as a different pair of glasses and that's really it. Uh, you know the vet uh, would suggest medication and so forth like that, and what we do is we go hey you know what was different what's changed and I always say that things aren't you know, necessarily sudden, there's always a reason for it. And then it deals with codependency and interdependency aspects of the behavior, low self-esteem, etc. Um, but at the end of the, of the day, gave uh, gave Lindsay some clarity. Um, I want to say thank you to Lindsay for giving me a shout out on the page there. But it is more about um, understanding what their dog's issue is and how to destructure the behavior down to a understandable psychological aspect of it. Um, I want to thank Cassian, who, like I said, in, in my YouTube channel, is she, he, she is telling me what I uh, can do to improve the way my vlogs are because I want to make them um, uh, easier to digest. And one of the notes that she said is, "Stop talking so much. Stop talking so much. Get to the point. Get to uh, get to the conversation, to the topics themselves. Have some, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 pre notes as well, which I was doing before. Sometimes I run out of time, and then just get to the point, so that way it makes it easier. Okay, so." Uh, tonight's topic, uh, episode 21, is stopping your dog from jumping on you. A lot of people have heard what to do about that from, from my colleagues. Uh, a lot of them have said, you know, turn away or to knee the dog in the chest, um, to walk away, to use treats, etc. and so forth like that. And those things unfortunately don't work. Uh, especially with a dog that's dysfunctional or higher than average dysfunction because they don't see that. It's just like trying to give a dog a treat. They don't understand it. Food does this in the canine world as a communication tool, much less a reward for it. So giving a dog food uh, is silly when they have a dysfunction. And the aspect of why your dog jumps on you. So I'm going to go through the points and I'm just going to, uh, then I'll go over it again. Um, okay. So the first point is why does your dog jump on you? Next is teaching your dog not to jump on you. Turning away, turning away is avoidance. Keep kneeing your dog. Understanding the, de the dependencies and the dysfunctions. How to stop your, how to stop the jumps with your bas with your basketball palm. Walking your dog down. 
Those Aren't Kisses, Desperation by Another Name, Finger Anxieties, Creating Calmness. So these are kind of a few steps that we can do, uh, and, and I'm going to try to keep them in a layperson aspect of it. Like I said, I don't want to get it too complicated, but uh, the way to get your dog to stop jumping on you is to understand why is your dog jumping on you. And I'm not talking about just a you know typical dog that kind of jumps up on you and kind of went, okay, that's fine, that's cool, you can deal with it. I'm talking about the dog that continues to jump on you, and when you when you try to uh, you know uh, get down to their level, they're still jumping on you, and they're all over the place, and they don't stop, and they just can't stop. And you can try to treat train them, you try to get them to sit, but a dog that's dysfunctional, highly dysfunctional, is not going to again listen to these aspects because psychologically they're being driven this way. The dog, your dog can't understand the logic process of okay dad's home mom's home i'm happy to see them they're going to give me attention i need to just wait and to calm myself because it's an emotional insecurity that the dog has because they're processing things on a rudimentary level a basic level right that you know, our dogs are basic emotion dogs even though they have a high codependency oh sorry a covert codependency our dogs are still only able to process things up to a certain level uh, like envy, jealousy, etc. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated uh, emotion, but our dog does understand the reasons of loss and dependency, etc. So uh, I'm going to go back to these points, and I'm going to try to keep this relatively quick, and uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, you know, um, I want to again kind of make this a lot easier for people to understand, so we're not uh, jumping all over the place. The question, like I said, is we need to understand why our dog jumps on us. Why is it that when we come home they're jumping on us, they don't stop, and they seem to be incessant in that need to, to approach us. And, and we're like, oh, you know, I wish you would stop. It's driving me nuts. Excuse me. Um, it's driving me nuts. And if you're not stopping, then, you know, okay. So uh, w w what the, the point is that I, I should get to is that getting back to the a couple of the other vlogs that I did. One is about why do dogs paw at us? And the, uh, I think there's another one as, um, uh, you know, barking out the window, uh, taking your clothing. These are codependency aspects of our dog's behavior. It's their need to feel that they belong to our group, our family, right? Like I said, uh, actually I spoke this, I think yesterday, or was it in the Awesome Mastiff Lovers group, where I talked about the fact that, um, you know, our, our dogs just don't know how to self-regulate because they're so excited, right? They want to be with us. They're 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 super happy, um, and we need to let them know that we're stable, that we're here, that we're not going to leave them, and that when we have come back, like I, I talk about language that we want to use, conversation that we want to use, and no strain in our tone of voice, we want to be able to talk our dog down from those anxieties. The codependency that our dog has when we leave the home, of course, they're like, oh my gosh, you've left without me. I can't believe you left without me. I need to be with me. You know, the, the, the more cogent dog, the more uh, comfortable, the uh, more secure dog is going to say, okay, you know, dad's leaving, mom's leaving, uh, you know, he'll be back. Uh, I just have to wait. And of course, it's hard in the process time through that abstract memory that they have which is a brilliant thing, which is why dogs are able to track scent and so forth like that um, and, and to gauge, you know, areas where they haven't been, but they're always been reactive to when they go back to that same area. The codependency that our dog has can sometimes be a high codependency, and that's where our dogs have been coddled too much, helicoptered too much, and it happens to a lot of people. I've done it myself. Our dog then learns to feed off of that in almost an unhealthy codependency like a stalker does. When the stalker just doesn't leave us alone, you tell her, hey, you know what, I'm not interested in you. Uh, I'm sorry, I just don't find that we have anything in common. And then um, she thinks that it's okay, maybe I can, you know, convince you in another way. With our dogs, or, or he convinces you, sorry. Um, so our dogs then see the point that, oh my gosh, where have you been? I can't believe you left me. I don't want to leave you. But I have felt so much anxiety being alone, I don't know how to self-regulate. I don't know how to control this this anxiety, this desperation, this loss of being alone, right? Because of my, the dog's codependency. So what do we do is we have to understand that our dog is jumping on us because they're, for lack of a better lay person's term, uh, they're, they're, they're desperate in the sense of, I need to get right to your face. I need to be with you. I, I need to feel that you haven't left me 
and I'm so happy and excited, but for the dysfunctional dog, it is that almost an obsessive aspect for them to be with us. And a lot of people will have dogs that are not just jumping, but when we try to hold them down or, or, or hang out with them, they're licking our face or licking and they're moving their heads in, in very jerkily, uh, jerky manner as well. It's because they're not able to control their physicality because the emotions are taking over them. They're just like, ah, right? And it's one of these things that we want to do is we want to address our dog's codependency by providing calmness in the way we conduct ourselves. And so we, we want our dog to know that yes, we acknowledge that you're excited to see us, but at the same time, you will get your attention. I have five dogs here. They all get pretty excited um, when that happens. And uh, where were you? When well, she, uh, turning away doesn't work. Yeah, yeah like I say, turning turning away doesn't work. Um, let me, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just going to turn off the comments today. I really, uh, not me. I mean, not turn off the comments. I'm going to turn it off so I don't see it. I uh, Rita, I'm so sorry. Um, and I know other people kind of. Oh, actually, what am I doing now? I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, uh, it's just uh, okay. Maybe not. Uh, I mean, I, so I guess I mean I, I won't be able to re won't respond um, just because I get so distracted by so many shiny things that go on every once in a while. Um, okay, so our dog is jumping on us. They're so, so happy to see us. And I have the Great Danes that are here, the significant, you know, 120, 140, 180 pounds. When they're jumping, they're jumping. And they're a size of a human being. As a, I'm 190 pounds, so they're the same size as me. They're broader in size because of the high barrel chest that they have. And they're jumping around. Uh, Minky the Jindo, it's the same thing, jumping around in frantic behavior, trying to say hi to me, you know, nosing me, trying to get me to pet him and all that stuff. It's their anxiety. The insecurity, right? Of course, it's low. It's not low self-esteem. It's just like, oh my gosh, I didn't know how to take care of myself. And now that I see you, I need to be in your face, right? I, I need to have. I need to, you know, be right on top of you. So we want to address that because it is codependency. And um, uh, you know, when you like Rita was saying about kneeing the dog and turning away and all that stuff. Um, I'll get to that in, in a few steps down here. Um, what we want to do is we want to, uh, so I'll get back to this part about why your dog jumps on you, right? So we know it's a codependency, our dog has missed us, doesn't know how to self-regulate emotionally, it's an Im emotionally immature dog, uh, the codependency, it comes back to the aspects of, you know, dogs taking toys, etc., uh, clothing as well. Um, so how do we teach our dog not to jump on us? When you come home, just be casual, right? Regular tone of voice. Uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm going to use a fake name for a dog because I don't want to get these guys thinking that I'm talking about them. Like I said, I always use all my dog's names so they know when I'm talking to them. They know who I'm talking to at all times uh, within reason, of course. Um, so I'm going to talk to my dog in a calm tone of voice. So I'm just going to use this name because of that. I'm drinking a Zevia. So I'm going to just say Zevia, hi Zevia. Good boy, Zevia, or good girl, right? Uh, it sounds like a girl's name, okay? So, hi, Zevia, good girl, you're okay, Zevia. You can hear the tone, you're okay, right? There's a little bit of fluctuation, intonation, but there's not too much. So, I'm keeping the tone on my voice within a certain parameter, a certain envelope. So, I'm not going, hi, Zevia. I'm going, hi, Zevia, within that, that, that envelope. If I bring it too high up or too low and start changing the tone too much, it will cause Zevia to focus on the higher tones and the lower tones because then she's thinking, why is there fluctuations? What is that feeding into? Is there not a conversation that's going on between us? And then she starts to think that it is either a play or a prey type of behavior that we're doing. You know, like a tug of war. I was talking about earlier in the Awesome Massive group. Um, you know how when we say something like, you want a treat? You want a treat? Our tone of voice changes. And it's tee, tee. it becomes disingenuous. It becomes uh, um, uh, superficial. The dog only sees the tone of voice as in the food. So we have to not train our dog that way. We have to use this part of it here, which is what I call in motion training. There's a, you know, there's passive training, what I call it, and then in motion training. And in motion training is taking the opportunity of the dog, our dog's natural behaviors, and training them through that aspect, somewhat like osmosis in motion. Okay, so in, 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 in motion training is, is what I'm calling it. Um, so what we want to do is when we do come home, see Zevia, and she's jumping all over the place, and, and I'm going to say that she's a Great Dane, 
right? Um, and Zeta is jumping all over the place, and she is right up at my eye level because that's how big she is. And I want to, at first, have a calm voice. And if I have to bring the bigger, louder voice of just calming down, I will say, Zevia, stop. I'll use a louder tone of voice. And then, of course, you're saying, well, that doesn't help. I can talk to her in any type of voice, and she's going to still jump on me. And no matter what I say, she's jumping on me. If I turn away, it'll stop her, or else maybe not turning her away. Uh, you know, I'll knee her in the chest. I mean, a lot of people have been told by trainers and behaviorists to knee their dog in the chest, which is kind of a really odd thing is if you were waiting for your uh, boyfriend and girlfriend to come home, right? You're waiting for your partner to come home. Yeah, he's been away on vacation or, uh, you know, for work for two weeks and he comes back home and he's excited you're excited and you're like oh my gosh i love you i love you can't wait to see you. i haven't seen you all i can't wait to hug you and then he just goes and just shoves you off of him the same psychology right we want to make sure that we behave with our dogs the same way as we would behave with a human being within relative context within that context that our dog is yes a rudimentary processing individual on an emotional basis but is also a predator and that aspect of it. So then they will register the behavior that we do as an, uh, as an offset to their codependency to us. In other words, what happens is we're what we, as we would do with a human, we're ignoring them. We're telling them that we don't validate your excitement to see us. We're segregating the emotional context from them and from us. We're, we're creating a divide like the Red Sea being parted. So we're creating that part of division which then is our subtle way of emotionally disenfranchising from our dog because we don't know how to handle their jumping up and down excitement. I have dogs uh, that have come to me who are, you know, in the beginning they're not that, you know, they're standoffish, they'll watch, and then afterwards they're just jumping all over. And I have to down train that aspect of it, otherwise they can become quite dangerous. Um, so it, it's a tone of voice within the envelope, not too high pitched, not too low. You can see I'm kind of keeping it constricted within the top of my voice here. At the top of my uh, my throat, the voice, and, and again, like I say, is when we talk to friends, we can tell in the way they talk to us whether or not they're being genuine or disingenuous. We can tell if they've had a, a tough day. We can hear things, the little nuances that our intuition evolved over a, a million years teaches us. We need to trust our intuition. That's why salespeople, top end salespeople, are so brilliantly successful because they know how to hear everything in us and manipulate or adjust or accommodate for what we need. So when it comes to that part, um, we, we want I want Zevia not to be jumping up and down. And I don't want to turn away from her because I'm just saying I'm ignoring you. You're not, not valid. And we do that because it, it stems from our own in the inability to understand confrontation with our dog. Even if it's passive or tacit confrontation, it's their uh, our dog Zevia. Zevia is looking at me straight in the eyes, and of course you're looking at her straight in the eyes. And then when she looks and makes eye contact with me, then what ends up happening is that she says, "Oh, great, great," and she starts jumping. Right? We do that. That's why we're like, okay, well, if we turn away, we don't make eye contact. She can't jump on me. Do you see the logic is faulty? That logic is completely faulty. Like I say, eye contact between dogs and humans is a trust issue. I make eye contact with extremely dangerous dogs, and they will sometimes lunge at me and do other things to me, but I always make eye contact with them within the context of that dog's behavior. So when your dog is jumping at you and you turn away because you're basically saying, I'm putting eye contact with you, I don't want to acknowledge your physical behavior, I'm turning away because the reality is you're avoiding eye contact with your dog who's excited to see you it devalues their position and they don't learn from us turning away the lower end dysfunctional dogs yes of course because they're not emotionally sophisticated in their uh, anxieties the highly dysfunctional dog doesn't understand that and they're going to keep trying and a lot of people who have the dysfunctional dogs at that scale you know, a V4, no, a V5 and up, V5 to V10, which is APDT's bite level three, uh, bite level four, I mean, bite level five, etc., bite level six causing death. My V4, my V5 is a bite level four, bite level five. So the bite level five, the V5 dogs on my scale, if I turn away, the anxiety continues. And because they're giant dogs, they continue to go after me in the sense of I want the tension. 
Uh, I want this attention satiated. I don't understand why I feel this way. I want to have affection from you by getting into your face. When I get to the other points, it's going to make a lot of more sense. So we don't turn away from our dog. We face them. We have to face them. We have to validate our dog's emotional uh, uh, context at that time of their anxiety of seeing us, their codependency, their fear of, oh my gosh, you left us. We want to continue contributing to building or rebuilding Zevia's level of self-confidence and self-esteem. When we turn away, we devalue. If I turn my head and I don't talk to you guys for this whole time frame, and I'm just talking over here, I'm going to raise my voice a little bit just to make sure that you can hear what I'm saying. If I talk like this for the rest of this session, you're going to change and go to a different... You're, going to, you're basically not going to watch anymore because it's like, why is the guy not even looking at me? Why is James not looking at me while he's talking about me turning away from dogs when my dog is jumping at me? Why is he not paying attention? It's irritating. It's devaluing. You want someone to make eye contact with you, even if it is out of anxiety. So we make eye contact. I make eye contact with Zevia. And it causes her to jump up on me more, right? Oh my gosh, you got eye contact. Now now we're connected, right? Like two lost souls across the you know crowded room. Uh, you're making eye contact with me. Okay, now now I need you to jump up on me, and I need I mean I mean I, I need to be with you. I need to because uh, now you made eye contact. You're acknowledging my desperation. That's why you're being told by uh, my colleagues to turn away because you don't understand the confrontation aspect of the eye contact, which is the devaluation of our dog's self-esteem and self-worth and self-confidence. We don't register our dog's behavior this way. We ignore them. And when we ignore them, they become more desperate. They become, without even understanding how their own ability of, of processing, they become devalued. And it creates and it, and, it, and, it, and it further enables that dysfunction of codependency, of high codependency that happens. Kneeing your dog in the chest is, as I said, your partner has come back after a couple of weeks, you haven't seen him or her for a long time, and then they you go to give them a big hug and they just shove away. And it hurts too. It may not seem like it hurts our dogs when we knee them, especially uh, some. I've heard some of these colleagues of mine tell people to knee the dog hard. That's brute force abuse. That's a that's an unskilled statement to make. You don't knee your dog in the chest, especially when they're happy to see you, and then you basically give them a punch in the chest. It's not a very nice thing to do. If it happened to us, we wouldn't want it. And at the same time, we basically are not doing the additional work that is needed to down train our dogs jumping. We're just being lazy. Kneeing the dog, turning away, we're being lazy. We don't want to confront. We don't want to do the hard work that's necessary when it comes to working with our dog to get them to stop jumping on us. To teach them that we are here. That I'm back, that I'm going to take care of you. You're going to get the hug. You're going to get the affection. The avoidance by turning away, the kneeing your dog, uh, it again is such an unsophisticated perspective that has no validity in, in, in modern dog training. It just doesn't. It makes no sense. It's banal and it just, uh, um, it's abusive. It really is abusive, especially the kneeing. We want to understand the dependencies and dysfunctions of our dogs. So de judging and depending on our dog's history and their overall issues, when the dog is jumping up and down, when the dog, uh, our dog is coming in through the, uh, uh, from different backgrounds, we want to understand what's driving them to jump on us. So we have a dog that's extremely skittish, like Minky, for example. He's going to be uh, full of anxiety and 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 just also an abundance of, of, of affection because he's like, oh my gosh, I've never, I, I, I saw you, you came back again, I wasn't left alone in a wire cage again, right? These latent memories, latent memories that he's gonna have. You have a dog that's been abused and beaten and then they become stabilized. You come in, they start jumping, but they jump in a different way too. They, don't, they jump a bit more um, mm, mm, controlled, okay? Um, it's just the aspect of uh, their uh, 
self preserve self preservation type of behavior. But okay, so the, there the, the dependencies all all dep are all variants of what's going on to the dot specifically. But so this is just generalized uh, uh, information that's going on here, right? See, I'm not even paying most of the eye contact uh, with a camera lens today on purpose. Um, and you see, it's kind of hard. It's shifty. It, it's it's not paying attention. And you're just like, I'm not really interested because he's not paying attention as much. He does, he's not really into this topic at all. But I am very much so. How do we stop our dog from jumping? Right. So we, we the dependencies and the dysfunctions. We these are just individualistic to to the dog's personality, to the history, abuse aspects, skittishness, and so forth like that. It's all it's all indicative uh, to that. It's relational. Again. You got to look at the way the dog is jumping at you, how they're doing it. They're energetic, excited, controlled. Uh, the rhythm that they're jumping on us, it's because the rhythm that even the rhythm that our dog jumps up at us is based on their cognitive processing and their dysfunctions as well. Just like us, we like different types of music. There's some people that love classical music, there's people who like uh, electronic dance music, there's people who like punk music rock and roll, classical. We like it because of the type of music that's in there, the rhythm, the beat in it as well. We have our own rhythm. As If we're sitting somewhere and we start tapping our fingers to something, we have a certain beat, a certain rhythm. Our dogs function the same way. So do you see how I I perceive dogs in a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one basis, on a sentient basis? I see each dog as a living being. So each dog is going to jump up. They're not going to jump up. They're going to be hyper. They're not going to be hyper. Uh, and it's back to the dog's dysfunctions. And, and, I, and the trainers of behaviors who actually want to really learn how to modernize dog training and, and connect to their dogs, their clients' dogs, they'll say to me, here's a video of, uh, of so-and-so jumping at me. Um, uh, or, sorry, uh, jumping at my owner, uh, my, sorry, my client. And, uh, you know, what do you think of it? And they'll and I'll say, well, what do you guys think of it, or what do you think? Of it? Should I not say guys of it because we don't do a lot of group PMs? <laughs> what do you think is happening? And then they'll give me their opinion, and they'll kind of be hedging. They'll be like one cent. It's like, well, I think the dog is so and so. And then when we look at the behavior, I'll explain to them. Look at the way your dog, uh, that that the client's dog is is moving around their owner, and, uh, is jumping up. How they're jumping up? If they're doing a three-handed, uh, three-footed jump or two-footed jump, or if they're doing a one paw up and then jump. Right then, then I say then it's indicative of this type of dysfunction or this type of behavior. It's all rooted in these other aspects of it. What I talk about is complicated, and in the beginning, a lot of people are like, "None of this makes sense. I don't understand any of this. It doesn't make sense." But then when they start to understand uh, that perspective, then they go, "Okay, that makes sense because now I can see it." So the rhythms and all that stuff that happened with our dog, all these little aspects of the behavior mean something. Same thing like us. We drive a car. We drive a car in a certain way. We stay within the lines. We stay closer to the left side of the lane, to the right side of the lane. Uh, we shoulder check a lot or we don't shoulder check a lot. Same thing with our dog coming up and jumping on us. How to stop the jumping with the basketball, the basketball palm. Okay? This is the simplest thing. No treats, no medication. Everything I talk about from, from basic aspects of getting your dog to stop barking by just talking to them uh, in that or or palming uh, or sorry should I say uh, you know dealing with dogs that want to attack people and other dogs using the the, the food and all that it's just silly. We use the palm to get our dog to stop jumping on us, and I use the I use the term basketball palm because we know what basketball palm is. We take the ball for those of us big hands, right? Uh, I don't I can't close that. Um, um, we palm a basketball. You remember when you were kids and your friends palmed each other in the head and we were like, you know, and like stay away, you know, when like my, my, my siblings, my younger sister, I would like palm her in the head. She tries to beat me up or whatever and she's like trying to swing and the palm is on the on the forehead. That's all I do with our dogs. That's what I would do with Zevia. That's what I do with all of them to get them to do that. I take my palm and I put it between their eyes and the bridge of their nose towards the top of their head like that. And I do that, and, I, and, I, and I'm careful not to poke my fingers into their eye, so I try to keep my palm together and my thumb close together. doesn't matter if you're a, a, a small woman, 
uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you have uh, huge hands or small hands like Donald Trump has small hands. It doesn't matter that that case. You just basically want to palm the dog downward and you hold him that way. So the bridge of the nose and you basically walk him down and that's it. You, you know, a lot of times when you first do it, the dog is trying to avoid you and they're trying to go around your hand to get to you. Eventually, if you're patient and it's going to take a number of tries, you place your palm against their head, the forehead, between the bridge of the nose, above the muzzle, and you basically walk them down. And then you'll have dogs that have a little bit more of an extreme aspect of behavior and where they they're, they're still can kind of get away. And what you do then is you take the palm and you take the other hand of yours. It doesn't matter if you're left or right. And you take it and you put it underneath their chin and you basically gently hold their head down like this. And you can see it like that. So the palm and then underneath the, the muzzle, you take, take them off you and you walk them down. And in the beginning, they're going to try to get away from you. They're going to try to move all over the place. So you keep palming them and again, taking them gently, moving them down firmly, but moving them down off you. Now, how do we get them down? So a Great Dane is going to be pretty hard to walk them down. A Labrador is not so bad. The smaller dogs are already on the ground to begin with. So what do we do with a larger breed dog? We palm them down by grabbing them this way. And we squat. We don't bend over. Because two things. One, if we bend over, we don't have the uh, foundational strength, the musculature strength within our bodies, the integrity. And the second thing is, as well, is when we bend down to do that, then our voice changes and our ability to control our volume of voice and our voice key with our dog becomes compromised. So we squat down and we walk our dog down. Okay, so now we've walked our dog down to the ground and he is like, we're squatted there and Zevi is just jumping all over me and she's all happy and she wants to still like in my face and she's licking my face and she's trying to do it and she's still jumping up and jumping up, right? You notice that some of the higher dysfunctional dogs will continue to jump up and continue to jump up and continue to jump up even if we're squatting at the same level as them because of that codependency the inability to self-regulate the anxiety the low self-esteem oh my gosh so they're not able to self-regulate and then when we're down and face to face they're like you're face to face with me uh, this is where I'm not sure and then their old habits of jumping and jumping continue so you see that's why they jump up on us okay so calm them down etc walk the dog down getting to their level now the next part is the dogs that have a bit of dysfunction that is uh, above average, they start licking at our face. Licking at our face, licking at our face, licking at our face, all over the face. They're just incessantly, they'll just keep licking and licking if they could. And it's a little bit irritating sometimes. I mean, I don't care if a dog licks me in the face. Uh, I have uh, clients' dogs that lick me in the face and all that stuff. I'm like, okay, whatever. It's part of their behavior. And then I teach the owner how to deal with it. But it's their anxiety, right? It's their, it's, their, it's, their, it's their dysfunction and their desperation. They're like, I got to taste you, right? Because it's a scent-driven aspect of it. It goes back to puppyhood. It goes back to some other intradependency and codependency issues, yada, yada. But I'm keeping it lay person today. So they're licking, right? And they're licking. And there's another reason why dogs lick our face when we come home. For those dogs those dogs that don't jump up on us and they're pretty cool, and they come up and they smell our face and they lick our face. So that's a different aspect of predation. But when it comes to this part of our dog jumping, we walk them down, we're squatting face to face with them. And they're like, ah, where have you been? And all that. And they're licking our face and everything. So just keep in mind that those aren't kisses. This is desperation on their part. Their inability to self-soothe on that really basic level. Like I said, the licking is is, is uh, re recalled towards the aspect of puppyhood and they're just desperate, right? They don't know how to deal with the codependency. They don't know how to, they don't realize that we're down at the level and they're just like, oh my gosh, I'm still doing because I can't jump. I, I've got to, I've got to uh, you know, satiate my anxiety and feeling that aspect of contentment, which I can't feel contentment because I'm all over the place. Like me, right? Wildly organic. <laughs> so... Uh, this is an all part what you do as well when they start kissing our face, licking and licking and licking uh, obsessively, you palm them away. That's it. You say, stop. Stop, Zevia. You're okay. Stop. If you have to be a louder, harder voice on it, if you have to shout at them, if they don't stop, don't do it right away. You bring it up. Voice key one, voice key two, voice key three, voice key four, up to you hit voice key ten. And for those of you who are like me, uh, and love spinal tap, voice key 11. Okay, so again, they start doing that, you just walk them away. Um, we won't get into the point for the dogs that are nipping, uh, that are 
you know, you start to do that and they start to nip at you. That's a bit of a different dysfunction, a different perspective. Um, but I, I definitely want to take um, uh, Cassian's advice uh, uh, um, and work beneficially on this and be focused on this topic, even though I've strayed a bit. <laughs> so start looking at our face. We just pull them away. It's the desperation aspect of it. So now what do we do, right? What do we do? What do we do? Because we don't want to feed into their anxieties and, and all that. So how do we create calmness in our dog? They want affection from us, right? I talk about in another uh, vlog about the codependency, the pawing at us, um, the dog taking our personal belongings. I haven't gone to that part before, but I, I, I've talked about it briefly on that. So how do we get this part of creating calmness in our dog? Well, by training our dog to get down to the ground, by training our dog to understand that we're getting to their level of desperation because that's why they're jumping up on us is because they want to be right here at our face they want to be here to lick our face so we bring their target which is us our face where our communication is right here we bring it down to their level even if it's a chihuahua you can still do that by giving them a certain type of a, a hug right what i talk about so again say you have a, a lab say zevia is a golden a lab right or a retrieve whatever and we're down at her level. I'm down at her level. And even though I'm still a little bit above her, because, you know, depending on where she is and how I'm squatting, she might be right here. And she's like, ah, 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 you know, help me, help me, help me, love me, love me. What we do is we bring her in for a hug. And I talk about hugs in another one because hugs is the basis of trust. Every single dog in this entire world learns, loves hugs. And proof of that is when your dog comes up to you, it's an affection aspect of it. They nose you. They start putting the paw on you. They hug. When you see dogs sleeping together or dogs that sleep with you, they are laying on top of us most times. Some of them want to paw. They want to have that affection out of that. And it's insecurity or whatever. Anyways. Okay. And then uh, you see uh, even uh, hidden camera video of dogs or wolves in caves. And you see their dogs actually laying on top of each other even in there. And these are predatorial dogs. But why are they laying on top of each other in the cave and they're sleeping on it? Codependency is that affection. <laughs> they want to feel the contentment of being with us. And how do they do it? It's getting as close as they can. The overt codependency that dogs have. They want to be as close to us as possible. Licking, jumping, where have you been, etc. So we just basically create the calmness by giving them a hug. And, and as I said about the hug, is it's a trust issue. All right. It, it is whether or not we know someone well enough to let them give us a hug or not uh, as the same way as it is with a human, uh, with a dog, right? Um, we want to, the dog's not going to let a stranger hug them, especially a dog that's been abused is definitely not going to let a stranger hug them. So we, the certain way to give our dogs a hug and not my clients know that, but we give them a hug and we calm them down. So when your dog is there, in whatever format that you're used to giving your dog affection, and that is what you're going to apply in a hug format, um, don't move your hands, right? I'm moving my hands around a lot and all that, but when you're holding your dog, don't move your hands because they're processing at a tenth of a second. And like I said, the dog is hypersensitive to touch, incredibly brilliant, incredibly brilliant. Uh, they can they can analyze uh, where they've been touched. Uh, that is, you know, you used to have a... a um, uh, you know, would try to trigger a dog, a Great Dane, when they would have walked by me um, and just touch the side of them. And immediately he could turn around. And even though I went to touch him and pull my hand away super fast, he could turn around and get me as I'm pulling my hand away and, and engulf my hand and sometimes hurt it quite badly. So <laughs> touch is very important. We all crave touch. We fall in love. We hold hands. We sit with each other, we hug, we kiss. Intimacy of sex, touch. Trust. And we give our dog the hug and we hold them still without moving our hands because you don't want to create the more of the animation to their dog, to our dog's behavior. I don't want Ziva to get even more hyper and jumping up and down on me because then she feels it. You see people at the dog park are playing with their dogs and the dog comes up and brings the ball back and the guy, the human goes, oh, good job. And they start shaking and roughing and all and the dog runs off a bit. It's the same thing as when you see a boxer in a ring and the manager, the coach goes and starts shaking the guy and starts slapping him on the back and all that. I used to, um, 
when I was younger, I used to uh, do some amateur competition in kickboxing and martial arts and stuff like that. And that's what my coach would do is get me all shooken up and, and you know, ah, you can do it and just uh, start getting riled up so I be more focused and more predatory on my behavior. If you're upset, the last thing you want is for someone to rile you up and shake you and, you know, you want them to kind of hold you and say, hey, you know, cool. Your, your, your partner has come back after the two-week work vacation and you want to jump and give him a hug and all that stuff. And you, he's not going to knee you in the chest. He's not going to turn his back from you and he gives you a hug. You can imagine when he grabs you, right? What do you do when you grab him? You haven't seen him in a while. You hold him and you squeeze him. And you hold him for seconds at a time. And you squeeze him. And you're like, just, I just want to hold you. I want to feel you. I want to just miss the smell of your hair, right? That kind of stuff. You hold him. And then you kind of, then after that, then you start kind of get, oh, where have you been? And all that. Because we disenfranchise emotionally on that visceral level. It's just brilliance of what dogs are. Brilliance of what humanity is about. But you see that part, right? So the same thing when you see somebody you haven't seen, you hold them tight. Like, oh my gosh, you're not going, oh, I haven't seen you in a million years. And oh my gosh, I'm glad you're alive. You, you know, you got out of the hospital. You're holding them. You don't want to let them go. You do the same with your dog because they, to them, it's 100% desperation on their end, that codependency aspect. So we hold them, oh my gosh. And we hold our dog in a hug. And we let them know we love them by just being calm and calm of voice, the consistency of our voice key you keep them calm. Um, there's some dogs, like I said, there's different parts of every dog that they like to be touched, uh, what I call the dog's joy spot. And it's the same thing as a human being, like some people like their hands held, some people like their arms around each other, some people don't like public displays of affection. For me, I absolutely love public displays of affection. I love holding hands. I'm kind of like a dog in that sense of it, in regards to being an overt codependent. I love to spend time, and I love to show it. You know, do the little things for, for the person I'm with. The same aspect with what your dog does to you. But don't know how to physically manifest it other than they've only got four feet, four legs. They don't know how to give you a hug as per se. They want to jump up on you. They want to give you a big embrace and all that. But again, they don't know how to manifest it. They don't have the, 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 the cognitive or the emotional context to process it and deliver it to you in a way that we as human beings understand. If you see the two dogs who haven't seen each other for a long period of time, what do they do? They're running around in circles after each other. They're running and circling and they're trying to jump on each other. Then they start running around and running around, etc. They don't know how to control it, but they're still running around. They're not jumping on each other, right? Sometimes they do, right? Sometimes they do and they're like, ah, and they start crying. They lay on the ground and they're, you know, all that stuff. But they're not being frantic in that behavior. So that frantic behavior with human beings on the dysfunctional, highly dysfunctional dog is a desperation to be right here. It's to have contact, to feed in, to satiate the codependency. You see the difference between dog behavior with dogs, each other, and the dog behavior with humans. One thing I want to definitely say is the cross species blessing that we have is absolutely unbelievable. And I talked about this earlier in, in another uh, group that I, like I say, awesome, massive lovers. We're human, we're skin and flesh, but we're human. Dogs are animals, yes, skin and flesh as well, but they're a different makeup, they're predatorial, their behavior is completely different, but at the end of the day, it's cross-species cohabitation. Dog and human, cross-species. And I talked before about how it's debunking the science uh, belief that the cohabitation is an evolving and the genetic aspect of it, and yada, yada, that dogs have learned to cohabit human but then science can't prove the fact that the wild dog or a dog that used to live in a home and then was abandoned lives outside what they call being come feral this 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 cohabitation this this emotional aspect the dog has with us in a domesticated dog so i'm calling the genus domesticated dog genus being a strain of the species uh, the domesticated dog themselves have learned that behavior. It's a predacious aspect of the behavior of overt codependency that they exhibit and the functioning level that the dog has. But the reality is the dogs themselves have 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 want they'd want to be with us, right? Excuse me. Excuse me. The dog themselves, right, they've learned to to crave our affection to create the contact, to be with us, even though they know by looking at us that we're not a dog. 
So it's this incredible blessing that we have to have dogs as part of our own life. The difference is we don't have chimp chimpanzees or orangutans as pets because of the brute force that they have. And a lot of you will remember lots of stories in regards to a, a certain dog, a certain chimpanzee, I think it was, that uh, attacked their his owners. Uh, I think whatever the dog's name, Bobo. <laughs> I mean, the, the chimpanzee's name, Bobo, or something like that. Uh, attacked his uh, his his humans and ripped off almost her face, and then was in a car, and then they had to shoot him. So with chimpanzees, which have the cognitive and a higher emotional quotient, at the end of the of the day, the chimpanzee can escape by climbing into the trees on the rooftops, and it's a huge hassle. And of course, it's the brute force strength that a chimpanzee has. You compare that to a dog's ability to bite us, and we're at relatively similar scale. But whereas a chimpanzee has the articulation of all four limbs and head to be able to exact even greater. Uh, uh, um, violence uh, in regards to should they attack us whereas a dog themselves their, their only weapon essentially is biting us that's ultimately it so with the dog themselves if they are a dangerous dog what do what does animal control do they corner the dog they snare the dog with a cat pole and then the dog is killed eventually right we have such human Human dominion, human human dominion, uh, dominance over over animals, and we have it over the dogs in our lives, and um, we should respect the fact how amazingly lucky we are to have such a uh, cohabitative, a cohabitative uh, relationship with with dogs. Cross species, they love us, and they would give their lives to defend ours. We need to appreciate the, the individual emotionality of each and every single dog. Without a doubt, if your dog was to go to somebody else for a day or five days, they would be kind of like, oh, I don't know about this other person, but they would never have the bond that your dog has with you. So it's our cross species, but we have to value this at a higher rate than what's happening out there in the in the dog training and dog psychology and the behavioral uh, academia that's out there right no, we need to look at the functionality of the dogs at the base emotional and logical process and context that it is with relation to the fact that we have a sophisticated brain whereas a dog is not able to process but my gosh at the end of the day out in the wild the dog is going to survive before we do and for a much longer period the domesticated dog can indeed learn to survive on the wild um, should they be put into a place that is a bit more advantageous as opposed to being um, somewhat dependent on the uh, the civilized environment that they are surrounding, right? You know, even dogs at the, at the dump. And I shared a, a video from three years ago from an animal rescuer. Um, they'll live in the dump because there's food there and they don't really learn how to hunt. And generationally speaking, they don't learn because they're still in a domesticated environment of civilizations, even if it's refuse, garbage refuse in the area. Uh, but again, after three generations, if they were not near food, not near garbage, not near human habitation, then that dog, three generations in any type of dom domesticated, uh, um, um, you know, uh, relevance will have already been uh, uh, bred out of the dog. Uh, but at the same time, you can bring a dog in from the wild and domesticate it. Proof in the pudding, as I've said before, is people are able to do that with wolves that have been injured. Bring them into the compound sanctuary, and you see pictures of where dogs are actually, uh, sorry, wolves are actually inside the home with some of these people as well. And it's the ability to teach codependency and safety and so forth and like that. Um, you know, so I just want to say let's let's really appreciate the fact that being able to have a dog in our life is an incredible blessing. Let's push forward in society to, to disprove to people like Karen Pryor, to Rebecca Ledger, to Ian Dunbar, that dogs are not just dumb and stupid where you just give them treats and, and if they don't comply, then we give them medication. And if they don't comply to that, then they're not fixable. These are people who are able to look at the reality of life uh, and the behaviors of dogs should they choose to do so. So, but instead, they look at it through an anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic conjecture of academia, which suppresses the dog's uh, relevance in society overall. 
Um, okay, so that's essentially how we do, getting back to that, how we calm a dog down from jumping up on us. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the comment section. I don't have the ability to respond back to them. Um, just because uh, it just like I said, it seems weird for me to respond back when it's live and not live comments, and then I feel guilty, and I just you know I'm like okay, I'll read them, and and go from there. I know a few people have made some comments about questions and all that stuff uh, regards to dog behavior. I'm gonna look through those and try to uh, apply them to the vlog. Um, those of you who have been watching um, some of my previous uh, uh, vlogs, uh, there was one that I had with. Um, I had that with, um, let me just see, with Prince, and that was Sarah's dog, uh, Prince, um, and I'm just going to bring this back a bit here, and she actually um, sent me a message, I just said to her, essentially the simplest thing, just a baby step aspect to some severe issues where Sarah was saying, uh, Prince is, you know, reactive and all that stuff, he was left outside for basically two to three months on a chain uh, with people he thought, they thought was going, were going to take care of him, and instead they didn't. Um, and they would somewhat, uh, they would be reactive inside the kennel, couldn't be touched without suddenly, suddenly, quote unquote, right, reacting and all that stuff, um, all these things. So I had said to um, to Sarah, and she was live commenting, which was great. <laughs> she said that um, uh, I said, well, I said to her, you know, you got to talk to him in a in a in that mothering voice that you used when you first got him, not like you do now, not like the babyish kind of voice, but you want to talk to him like when you first got him. And so, um, what she had written down back here, um, okay, and this is actually, it's kind of funny, uh, not funny, but it's interesting. On Friday, um, before I did the vlog that same night, she said, uh, and I didn't see it in time, but she said, he keeps growling at me. Tonight, my husband tried bonding with him and let him fall asleep on the couch. I called him by his name, and he instantly went into flight mode and growled aggressively, uh, growled dangerously. Uh, can we go over what not uh, what not to do, please? I don't want to put myself in a dangerous position. And then I did the vlog, um, and she, uh, uh, Sarah uh, sent me the message and said, Hey, James, thanks for the vlog the other night. My husband watched it as well, and we will answer all the questions and comments so that we're more clear, but we have been keeping him free range, and I'm happier about that. Which I said free range is because she was putting him into, they were putting him into his kennel, then he would become reactive and, and, and you know, angry when they got near his kennel uh, territorial aspect in that sense of it uh, so I said back to her that's great how's Prince use the same mom voice that you used when he was a baby right baby puppy baby and then she replied earlier tonight uh, about uh, two hours ago uh, said, I have been and he's calm he still plays a bit rough and he does a growl here and there but we sit low and calm him down and he seems to get out of it a bit uh, but since we stopped using the cage, he isn't going to serious growling mode again, which is good. So all these little baby steps that we talk about, and you, if you see the vlog, um, I'll go over this and I'll put the links into this one today. Since I was just kind of exhausted. I haven't eaten today, um, so I'm a bit starving here. Um, but all these little baby steps that we do seem like insignificant aspects to us. To our dog who's lived an entire lifetime, that slightest little bit of adjustment is profoundly impactful on a psychological level because our dogs are predation, they're processing what's going through. So by making that slight shift, our dog understands. We're understanding them. It's like meeting somebody and falling in love with them. You understand that they understand you and you understand them. Simpatico, love, bond, true love. We want to understand our dog because, again, they're processing at a tenth of a second. So every time something shifts, they're paying attention to it. When we show our dogs that we're paying attention to their behavior and their reactivity, their aggression, their quote-unquote unpredictability, we're anticipating issues, understanding their environment is different. So like it was with Linda, I talked about that a little bit earlier, just a small little change that creates a shift. When we show someone that we understand what's wrong, if we're talking to the person on the phone and the voice is kind of odd, the guy whose mom died, right? Hypothetically, the guy whose mom died and isn't saying anything on the phone and, and your friend's just kind of talking like odd on the phone. If we go and say, hey, you know, you sound kind of weird today or something's odd. Is everything okay? And they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm okay. I'm okay. And you say, are you sure? Like, uh, no offense or anything, but I, uh, you know, we've been friends for a very long time. But just kind of seem you little, you know, and our intuition is like he's talking differently, his scent, uh, sound of his voice, or, you know, she's she's acting odd, whatever. So, you know, 
are you sure? I mean, it just seems a little bit odd. And then what ends up happening when you start showing that you care, the person goes and says to you, well, you know, my mom died, right? The person says to you, yeah, my mom died. They tell you something's wrong. And then you start having this incredible relationship of conversation with them. When you see them, you have the affinity, the understanding. You've been through a trial of fire, which is their experience with immediacy of the death of their mom. Same thing when it comes to our dogs. We create that immediacy of contact, of conduct with them in that we're telling our dogs we understand why you hurt. We understand what the problem is. We understand why you're having the dysfunction, why you're having fear, insecurity. When we come home and our dog is jumping up on us, when we bring ourselves down to that level, we're saying to our dog, we understand that you want to be this close to us. So we're going to let you to do so, but under our, our guidelines, our rules. I'm not going to turn away. I'm not going to knee the dog, our dog in the in the chest. I'm not going to, why would I hurt my dog when he when she's happy to see me? Why? I'm going to show the appreciation of it by getting to their level, to my dog's level. And, and, and saying, let me help you calm down a bit, but here I am. I'm here exactly where you wanted me to be. Yeah, that's true love. That's that connection that we have. That's why we have this incredible cohabitative, uh, cohabitative ability with the cross species. So Prince and all these other parts, uh, uh, and I think if you look at some of my other uh, other posts, you have people who are saying, uh, you know, I tried what, you, what you're saying the other day, James, and it's working now. And it's amazing, and it's unbelievable, and you know, they, they say things along the lines which are uh, extremely flattering things um, about uh, about my uh, perception. Um, but it's not me, right? I, all I'm doing is teaching people how to do it themselves, what, they've, what you've all been able to do with each other, what you've all suspected about your own dogs. You're doing this. I'm just showing you how to do it. I'm going to end this off. Please follow my YouTube channel. Please help support. Please share my post. I, 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 you know, Sarah's been great. She did it even before I asked her. She shared my post, subscribed to my YouTube channel. So she, Sarah subscribed to my Instagram and, and all that stuff. And I really appreciate it because the more people who are following uh, my work means the more friends of theirs who go, oh, look at, you know, there's a notification that so-and-so's watching James Chai. And then that information gets up. This aspect of the dog jumping on you, there's no treats, there's no medication, there's nothing. And it, you'll do this, and do this for a couple of weeks straight. Don't slack off. And you'll see consistency happening for you, and you'll see it continuing onward. And you'll find when you come home each and every time, your dog is no longer jumping, as long as you get to their level. There's a few people in my closed group that have uh, had similar type of issues. And the result was pretty strong, forward, progressive as well, and much more calmer. So... Um, again, share my posts. Uh, I, I have uh, uh, fundraising um, platforms for Patreon and GoFundMe as well. I just need another 50 bucks in there so we can uh, uh, donate a session to, uh, to somebody of your choosing, our, our, our followers choosing. And uh, again, uh, I wish everybody a great time. I will talk to you all tomorrow. Let me know if there's anything that you uh, want to talk about, comment, etc., and uh, I appreciate it. Please be kind to other people. Please be kind to yourself. Celebrate the little wins that you do in your life. All these amazing things that you've done that you may not realize people have recognized it. Recognize it in yourself. Reward yourself. Buy yourself a little comfort food. Go out there if you like, you know, chocolate bars, your favorite chocolate bar as a kid. And you've done something cool for yourself. Instead of saying, no, I can't do it or, or I can't, uh, you know, I don't deserve it or it's just silly to, to reward. Go out, buy yourself a piece of comfort food. Buy yourself a chocolate bar. Splurge on something just for those few couple of enjoyable mini vacation minutes. Uh, the more you're happy with yourself, the more you're happy with it, the rest of the world. And that's what we want. Let's change this world. Let's improve the lives of dogs. Let's improve the lives of us humans. Let's make this an, an amazing world that we always knew was here. Take care, and we'll talk tomorrow. Bye-bye.